Welcome everyone. Nice to see everyone. Thank you for coming. How's everyone doing today? Doing good? I can't see no faces, but that's okay. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. All right. Very so we're good. actually going to get started. Thank you guys for coming. Um, I want to thank you so much, Dominique, for bringing this amazing workshop to you know our community and all the students. Because um, there's actually a lot of students that are not affiliated with UB that came here. So we know that this information is so valuable and so important. And I just got to shout you out for the one time because you really came through. And I'm so excited and honored to have you here. So are you ready to begin? Yes, I am. Thank you so much, Patrice, for um, just wanting to reach out to me and wanting to collab with me. I honestly feel so honored to be here. And I'm just hoping to, you know, share a little bit about my story and also um, share as much value as possible with you guys about the AMCAS application process and how to secure your white coat. So yeah, I definitely don't want to hold you guys up any longer so we can get into this presentation now. So let me share. Second. Okay. Okay, so <laughs> securing the bag, aka your white goat guys. Um, I really just want to share, you know, more about me and how I was able to, you know, secure my dreams of getting the white coat and getting to medical school and soon becoming a, you know, a medical doctor. And I just hope to be able to share as much gems to you guys and how to make your dreams come true as well. So let's get started. So first, I'm going to start out with my personal story. Um, so who, who am I? I know a lot of you guys come from the graduate um, student health pre-health um, pre club. So I know some of you may not know who I am at all. Um, some people may be from my Instagram or even my subscribers on YouTube. But I do just want to give you guys as much information as possible about who I am so you have some context. Um, so I am an MS1 at University of Buffalo, Jacobs School of Medicine, um, an ASM certified personal trainer as well. I'm from Long Island, New York, and I attended Pepperdine University in Malibu, California. Um, graduated there from in 2019 with magnum cum laude with a BA in Hispanic stu studies, and I fulfilled all my pre-med recs as well there. Um, so I got all of those out the way in undergrad. And then I took two gap years after that. So first I was able to work as an intern um, in like a clinical setting, I worked in private practices for a cosmetic doc dentist um, who was in Brooklyn, New York, and also in Long Island, New York. Um, but then the pandemic hit literally shortly within, shortly after within my gap year. So um, more than half of my gap year was spent also being like an online coach, uh, fitness coach, because I am a certified personal trainer as well. So yeah, I was doing that. Um, so I do want to share with you guys, though, how I was introduced to medicine and how I was inspired early on to go into it. Um, so my father was a, a physician and early on I was introduced to medicine at a very young age. Um, he I remember kind of my first moments when it comes to medicine. It was actually when I was coming to um, New York City because we are pretty close to New York City and Long Island. But I went to New York City with my father and literally that day ended up falling on 9-11. And obviously that's such like a tragic day, chaotic day. Um, I was really young. I was super young, but I really do remember like just vivid moments of like there being a lot of smoke and my father having to rush me back home. And he worked in the city as a, a physician. So he had to rush back to New York City and literally serve as much patients as possible that day. Um, and in addition, he actually won an award for his service that day. So like early on, I literally looked at my, my father as like a superhero. And I felt like one day I wanted to be a superhero just like him. Um, so I feel like that was what really exposed me early on to medicine. And then growing up when I got through, you know, middle school, high school, um, I kind of like even realized even more like how my father um, was just an inspiration to, our, to my community, like being a black man in medicine. Um, it was just, you know, really important to see like how representation matters within my community. And it really showed, you know, how inspiring he was. And I felt like that was something I also wanted to continue in his legacy and just really just make sure that people recognize how important representation is um, so that people can just see themselves in fields and not feel like, you know, they don't, not feel like they have to give up and just feel like they can keep persisting towards the fields they wanna go into and they see people that look like them in those fields. So representation definitely does matter. Um, so yeah, it was um, a little over two years ago. My father ended up passing though from acute myeloid leukemia. Um, and that ended up being like three months before my MCAT. And I remember, 
obviously just such a life-changing moment, but I felt like my father was just like telling me to just keep going, to keep pushing. And I felt like um, I just didn't want to give up on my dreams because I felt like I was going to make him proud by, you know, continuing and going towards, you know, the end goal, which was to, to become a doctor and continue into his continue on with his legacy as well. Um, so yeah, I literally, um, you know, it was really challenging, obviously a really hard, difficult time to study for the MCAT. But um, after, you know, completing the MCAT and getting to this point now where I'm in medical school, I really do feel like I made my dad proud. Um, and I feel like I'm saying this mainly because I know so many people have their own stories, have their own challenges, have things that they're going through, obstacles, um, so many things that happen that you may not even expect. And I really feel like I just want to encourage you to keep going, to literally keep going after your dreams, because I feel like at the end of it, you'll be so proud of yourself. You'll be so happy and know that it's worth it in the end. So don't give up, keep persisting. Um, and you got this. So um, next, I do want to be as transparent as possible when it comes to my stats, guys. So yes, I did get a 500 on my MCAT. Um, I ended up being getting a 3.71 as my GPA in um, college. And this just tells you that, you know, I was no way a perfect student, a uh, perfect candidate. Um, and I did not have, you know, the perfect stats at all. But I do want to emphasize that being a well-rounded candidate is very important. And um, Obviously, being a well-rounded candidate is different for everyone. Everyone has their own passions. Everyone has their own um, things that bring them joy. So it really um, matters to just stick to what you love to do, what you're passionate about. And I feel like letting that shine through within your application is very important. So one thing I do want to say is to make sure what you do matches what you say on paper. So if you're saying you're passionate about these things, you want to show that you have experiences that kind of match up with those passions that you're saying you have. Um, so for instance, um, some of my passions include working with the underserved. Um, so I was able to be working in the volunteer center at my school as the hunger and homelessness coordinator for two years. And that was one example of like showing that I do like to do love to work with the underserved, traveling and immersing myself into different cultures and diversity is super important to me as well. I was able to study abroad um, my sophomore year um, in Argentina for that entire year. And then I also went to Spain for two months after that. So that showed, you know, I am passionate about those things. Um, preventative healthcare and health equity. As a fitness trainer, I was able to show that I am passionate about helping people, you know, stick to the fitness journey and um, to prevent some of the chronic diseases that, um, you know, are preventable with, you know, having sticking with a healthy diet and, you know, sticking with working out on a um, consistent basis. Also, health equity, I was able to um, work with a medical clinic in Argentina when I was there, um, with this foundation where they their mission is to eradicate malnutrition. So that is something I also spoke about within my application. Um, so I do want to say, though, that I also did not have any research experience, guys. Um, so if you're someone that's going to be applying the psycho and you haven't been able to get research experience and you're really worried about that, I just want to do want to say that it is possible to get in without any research experience. Um, definitely, you know, try your best to get research experience. I feel like I want to let you guys know that um, it is important to tr strive to be like the rule um, and not the exception because um, you just want to do as much as possible to have like, you know, the best chance to get into medical school for sure, but don't feel like that it's, you know, it's your, um, it's going to cancel you out or you're not going to have a chance to get in simply because you don't have any research experience. We have so many other factors to our story and so many other things that kind of um, just show who we are and um, why we want to be a doctor. So definitely just highlight the things that, you know, you are willing to bring to the table. Okay. So next, I'm going to talk about my personal AM, um, AMCAS application cycle period. So I was the 2020 to 2021 cycle. Um, I took the MCAT January 17th, 2020. My score came out around February 17th. Um, it took, takes like a month for it to come out. Um, then the pandemic shut down everything for literally, I, I think it was from March up until like June, but it honestly might've even been later than that, to be honest, but um, definitely shut down all the testing and ultimately, I had a lot of reasons why I felt like I wasn't, um, I didn't, um, I felt like I shouldn't take the MCAT again because of the testing being canceled for a while. Um, it was just so many different factors, but also I felt like um, God was literally telling me that um, he's going to make a way. So I literally submitted my application without retaking the MCAT. And I literally just had faith that um, I would end up where I'm supposed to be. So yeah, um, I ended up applying on June 19th, 2020. That ended up being Juneteenth, of course. And that was also Father's Day weekend. So it was very special to me to submit my application that weekend. Um, 
And my application ended up being processed and sent out to each school on July 23rd. So it does take sometimes a few weeks up to like a month or even more sometimes for it to be completely processed. So definitely, you know, apply earlier, um, as early as possible. Okay, so I do want to break down my acceptances, waitlist, rejections as well. Um, so I applied to 27 MD schools, guys, um, and I got three interview invites. Um, I'm really shedding light on the dates of these interview invites because I feel like so many people, um, so many people have different experiences when it comes to their MCAS application process. And I just wanted to share my process because so many different dates I received interview invites on. Um, so my first interview invite was from Geisinger. I received this on September 29th, and I was really happy about this. I was like, wow, it's September. Like, this is pretty early on. Um, I must be getting a lot more, you know, interviews coming out soon. Like, and I was honestly like, just, I was, I thought like, you know, this is totally good. Definitely going to get a lot more interviews coming up. Um, but that was definitely not the case. I had wait, I had to wait like another five months, February 26th for my second interview invite. And in between that time period, I received so many rejections. So rejection after rejection after rejection. Um, and it was, you know, it definitely came with a lot of anxiety, a lot of like um, just self doubt and insecurities. I was like, wow, like, is, is it going to happen for me? Um, and so many people say like, you may not even receive like, you know, an interview invite after January or like, um, just don't expect much after that. But when, when I re um, received my interview invite on February 26, I just remember being so happy. And I just literally felt like um, for some reason, UB was going to be my school. Like right away, I started looking up apartments by the area. I was like, okay, where am I gonna go? Um, but yeah, I ended up having my interview the next day, the next week after that. And then um, it went extremely well. By the way, this first interview, I ended up getting waitlisted at. Um, but this interview, I ended up you know, doing extremely well. I felt like it went great. I honestly felt like I did get accepted. Um, and yeah, the next week after that, I got my acceptance letter on March 12, 2021. And that was the best moment. Um, it felt amazing. It was it really just, I can't, it was such a memorable, memorable moment. I felt so happy. Um, and right away, like I knew I wanted to go there. So um, I withdrew my application from Geisinger because I was so waitlisted. I ended up um, committing to UB. And then I received my third interview invite on May 31st from Meharry Medical College. So that was, you know, not expected at all um, because this is just really, really late in the game. But yeah, I ended up getting three interview invites and I declined that interview from Meharry. Okay, so. Um, I do just want to emphasize as well that the year I um, applied, the most applicants ever applied to medical school, which is just wild to think about. Um, so this shows the years of the entering class. So my first year class of 2021 was larger and more diverse than any before it. Um, it was from 37,000 to usually 39,000. And my year that I applied was 46,758 um, applicants applied and was a 21.2% increase from the year prior. Um, so I just want to reiterate, guys, I literally got accepted with a 500 MCAT score and no research experience. So blessed is literally an understatement. Um, so I also want to share with you guys, though, like this moment that I received my acceptance letter um, from UB. And I was literally in, at the gas station with my boyfriend. He's literally pumping gas. We're about to go out to eat. And I literally just decided to go on my email and get the acceptance letter. And I was just I was I literally screamed like everyone in the gas station was looking at me like, what is going on? Um, but yeah, this is what happened. <laughs> Baby girl got into med school with us. I got into school, y'all. Yeah, this is crazy. This is crazy. <laughs> so as you can see, I was very excited. Yeah. Baby girl got into med school with us. I got into school, y'all. Yeah, this is crazy. This is crazy. <laughs> Okay, next. Um, so enough about me now. That was my story, but I do want to just give you guys as much value for you all and anyone that's applying this application or even in future application cycles. Um, hopefully this can just be as you know very valuable to you and very helpful for your process. So um, yeah, if you're applying this cycle, guys, it opens up on May 4th, 2022, um, and you could submit as early as May 28th. Um, they will start transmitting the medical, uh, transmitting the applications to medical schools as early as June 26. So it does take a couple weeks to, you know, verify and process your application. Um, and regular deadlines stretch until December. And then if you're applying early decision, the deadline is August 1st. Um, 
Like I said, though, guys, it's rolling admission. So the earlier you apply, the better. Um, I really say, ideally, you should complete the application by June, honestly, July, the latest, I would say. But if you have to push it back, that's OK. But I just say the earlier, the better, because it is rolling admissions. And you just want to have like, you know, the, the best chance possible to get into medical school. OK. So plan ahead and research everything, guys. I really want to emphasize being proactive in this application process. You don't want to be caught off guard by anything. You don't want to be um, shocked by anything coming your way. So really just do as much research as possible when it comes to um, applying to medical school. Um, I personally only apply to MD schools, but do as much research for DO schools, for um, Texas. I think they have Texas as a different application system, Caribbean schools, whether you're applying to a different application system, definitely do as much research on it because I will just be talking about the AMCAS application. So, and even so, like still do more research so you know as much information as possible. All right, so I'm gonna go throughout um, the components of the AMCAS application now. So first I'm gonna talk about letters of recommendation. So um, usually you need to submit at least three letters and I say it's probably the academic professor, the science professor, um, any other professor and a supervisor, mentor or advisor. Um, you can upload up to 10 letters on AMCAS and you can decide which letters you wanna to send to which school as well. So that's something that you could definitely um, use. And you want to make sure that you enter each writer on the AMCAS and then provide them with the letter of recommendation form so that they can send the letter um, to AMCAS for themselves. Um, obviously, you won't be able to see the letter, so you have to make sure you send them the you give them the letter of recommendation form. Um, also, guys, I recommend requesting letters as early as January. Um, this is what I did for the application cycle that I was applying for. Um, I just feel like that really gives your application, your letters, um, letter writers as much time as possible. Like I knew a lot of my um, writers were very, very busy. Either they were doctors or they were professors. And I just felt like, you know, I never know how busy they are. So I just want to give them as much time as possible to work on it. And then I would follow up with them, you know, pretty much like once a month or a, every couple of weeks just to make sure that, you know, they know that when the deadline is, and have everything sorted out by the time I want to apply. Um, so yeah, there are a couple different options. So I say I definitely had a um, pre-health committee letter. So if you have this at your school, definitely take advantage of this. Um, I know not, a, not every school provides this, but if you do have a institution, I feel like it is something that is um, very, very helpful. Um, I know my pre-health advisor was very helpful for me and I ended up having a great relationship with her, but she was able to create this letter where she had the, um, her like personal letter and that was like the committee letter and then behind it she attached the letters from um, everybody else that was at my institution that was writing one for me and that was like my professor my science professors my Spanish professor. Um, I think my Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority graduate advisor and then also my um, supervisor for my at the volunteer center. So she compiled all that together and she was able to you know talk more about uh, me from her point of view as well, so that was just super cool. And then I also um, got an individual letter from my clinical experience within my gap year. But yeah, these individual letters can be from professors, clinical experiences, extracurriculars, um, community service, etc. And just make sure you choose your letter wisely because um, they really do matter for sure. And sometimes they even ask you about them during your interview. Okay, so um, experiences section. You want to make sure that um, you definitely work on this early on as well. So I started working on this. I'm actually not exactly sure, but I feel like it was um, at least six months before applying. I started working on my experiences section. Um, you do have a maximum of 15 experiences and you have uh, three most meaningful experiences that you could put in as well. So um, it's the three most meaningful and then also 12 extra experiences on top of that. So you want to start brainstorming early on, um, be involved in activities that you're actually passionate about. Um, so if you, you know, show consistency and effort, you can also make sure that, you know, maybe get like a leadership role in those positions and also like get a letter of recommendation out of them. Um, so I feel like definitely showing, uh, figuring out what you're passionate about early on is something that's useful. Um, also start thinking about how your experiences create a story because this will help you, um, you know, master your personal statement. So that's something you can definitely start thinking about as well. And then be concise and include what you did and what you've learned from this experience. Um, and then there are 18 AMCAS work and activities categories that you can select from. So there's a, definitely a large variety of them. Some of them include community service, research, hobbies, extracurriculars, 
clinical experience, teaching, shadowing, et cetera. Okay, so personal statement. Um, so this is the main section that will definitely set you apart from other applicants. So you want to be yourself and share why you want to be a physician. Um, I would say think of one to, three, one to three experiences in your life that really impacted your decision to pursue medicine. Um, write down these ideas. Be super casual at first. Like, don't think too much about it. Um, just start writing down your ideas and just eventually you'll gain like, you know, a better um, flow of your, you know, personal statement. And you want to have a lot of time to have multiple drafts for this because you don't want to rush this. This is, I feel like the most important part for your application. So um, just be patient with it, but also give yourself a lot of time. Um, and I would say have three to five people read and edit your um, application as well. This could be an advisor, a parent, physician, professor, medical student, writing center, et cetera. Um, don't summarize or repeat what you wrote on the experiences list, guys. Um, don't talk too much about other people. Definitely talk about yourself. This is your personal statement. And then don't overuse medical terminology or words you wouldn't normally use. Um, I feel like they definitely can tell when you're trying too hard. Um, so don't, you know, don't overuse that and just be yourself. Okay, so now for transcripts. Um, when you open up the AMCAS application, I, I think like May 4th, it'll open up. You wanna start just putting in all your personal information. You wanna start putting in your demographic information. You wanna start filling out all these like sections, experiences section, personal state section, and then it'll come down to your transcripts. And you wanna make sure you do this as soon as possible because you, it may take you know, a couple of weeks for your school to send out um, these transcripts to AMCAS and you don't want that to be the reason why your application is held up or you can't submit it in time. So definitely do this as soon as you open up the AMCAS application um, and you just wanna enter each school that you've been enrolled at, even if you transfer credits guys and then provide this transcript form to your transcript office. Okay, the MCAT guys. So I recommend 46 months of studying, depending on your schedule, um, at least, and take your MCAT by April or May, the latest, if you can, for the application cycle that you're applying for. So it does take a month, um, usually for the scores to come out. So um, if you apply, if you take it in April or May, it could come out from May or June. And I feel like at least that's good so that you could submit your application right away, right after that, um, and it doesn't hold you up again. Um, so registration for the MCAT usually opens up on a designated day. So you, I recommend choosing your date as soon as you can so testing sites don't fill up. And I recommend taking advantage of all the AAMC resources as those will be the most similar to the actual exam. Definitely recommend using every single one of those resources, like all the practice exams for sure. Um, and then the initial registration fee for the MCAT exam is $320. Rescheduling fees between $50 to $200. Um, yeah, so definitely applying to medical school is a lot of money, guys. So I just want to put some of the costs so that you guys know to just really start budgeting out for all of these um, extra fees that we have. So CASPER, not a lot of people know about this CASPER exam, um, but it's a situational judgment test. It's a type of psychological test that will present you with realistic hypothetical scenarios and ask what you would do when faced with the particular situation and why. Um, so yeah, this was, it's a really simple, it's not really like a, a exam you need to study too much for, but it is something that you, most schools will require. Um, so definitely, you know, do your research on it. It includes ethics questions and personal reflections. Um, it has 12 sections within it. So it's like an eight video-based questions and four passage-based questions. And you can prepare by utilizing free sample questions on Casper or any other free resource such as Astroff. Um, yeah, so also you can read or watch videos on ethics questions on YouTube. I feel like this is not something you should, you know, pay for anything to um, prepare for. You can honestly get free resources online. And we already spend way too much money for other, you know, other um, fees. So I feel like this is something you can definitely get for free. Um, also, I don't think it's necessary to prepare more than a month for this, even less. I feel like it's is good um, and you don't get to see your score by the way. So this is something that's immediately sent out to the schools and you don't get to see your score at all. Um, so that's interesting. But then also the CASPER test is $10 plus another $10 for every school you designate to receive your results. That could definitely add up. So um, definitely keep that in your budget. Okay, 
So school selection, the number of schools you apply to truly depends on you and how confident you feel about your application. Um, coming into the application cycle for me, I knew that I wanted to apply to a good amount of schools. Um, so I applied to 27. My health, pre health advisor, though, told me to honestly apply to at least 30. Um, so that's probably even lower than I probably should have. But yeah, definitely, you know, you know how your application is, how confident you are about it. Um, I feel like at least 15 schools though is a good, um, good estimate, but yeah, depending on your application, definitely see to yourself like how much you think, how many schools you wanna to apply to um, and definitely budget for that. Um, so I utilized MSAR and that was, I forgot like what that actually means, but basically you're able to um, use this online tool to figure out, you know, the um, average stats at that certain school or just information about that school. And I feel like um, it's definitely very helpful to use, but don't let it discourage you from applying to a school simply because your stats don't lie, align with them. Um, so personally, you know, I did not let that, you know, stop me from applying to the schools that I applied to. And I feel like that's exactly why I'm here now. So I'm happy that I didn't let that stop me. Um, and I created like a school list as well to help stay organized with information and also getting in my secondaries on time. And I'll show you guys that in the next slide. Um, so the 22 application, 2022 application fee is $170 for the first school and $42 for each additional school you apply to. Um, and then the secondary application costs $75 to $150 per application. So that's a lot of money that you wanna start budgeting for as well. Okay, so I made this like final school list ex um, example for you guys. This is actually what I used so that I could stay organized. Um, I have the like, school name, location, distance, category, reach, target, safety. Um, honestly, there really isn't any such thing as safety schools within medical school process, but um, just you know, try to figure that out. And then meeting GPA, meeting MCAT, public or private, tuition, campus type, primary care rank, research rank. And then I made sure that I had a section where I said if I received the secondary or not, and then whether I completed that secondary. Um, that's important because once you submit your primary application at one like short pe time period, you'll receive so many secondaries at once and you want to, you know, definitely stay organized and make sure that you submit all your applications and you want to get them in as soon as possible too, because you don't want to take too long to submit your secondaries. Um, so yeah. By the way, I did use MSAR for all this information here, so. Okay, so secondary applications, it is by invitation only. Um, so you wanna consistently check your emails and your spam. You don't wanna miss out on the secondary application at all. Um, and just continuously check your email throughout the entire process because you don't wanna miss out on interviews either. Um, that is definitely something you don't wanna do. Um, so include, the secondaries include answers to questions and essays. And you wanna make sure that re you research each school that you're writing for so you see how you align with their mission. Um, MSAR is actually a helpful tool for that as well, but you could also just go on all the school's websites and just gain more information from there. Um, consider the primary and secondary as one long application. So you don't just wanna repeat what you wrote in the primary application. However, you wanna make sure that you stay, what you say is consistent with what you said in the primary as well. Um, and yeah, proofread it, get feedback. You can get like about three people to just read it, read your secondary application, just make sure, you know, they like it as well and just give their feedback. And then the earlier you submit, the better once again. And I feel like you should prepare as much as possible for these secondaries as well. So this website, um, perspectivedoctor.com, that's what I use to make sure I knew all the different prompts that the schools usually give out for secondaries. So you can go ahead and look this up as well. I could actually put the link um, in the chat soon, but at the end of this. But yeah, so you can definitely find out all the different questions that most of the schools will ask you so that you can prepare yourself for when they give you the secondary application. Um, you're not scrambling to answer all these questions at once. Um, definitely don't fill out every single answer um, from the from this list, because sometimes they don't ask the same questions. But I feel like if you have like a commonly asked question throughout all the schools, definitely start writing down your answer. And then once you get the secondary, you can just edit and just you know change it up a little bit so that it fits each school. So yeah, that's secondaries. All right, so you did the primaries, guys. You did the secondaries, and that's 
probably the biggest part of it all. Now you're literally just waiting for interviews and you're in interview season. Um, this is you know, the last hurdle before becoming a medical student and then getting closer to that dream of becoming a doctor. So this is something that's still super important though. So you wanna prepare as much as possible for this. Um, and I don't think I have to say this, but you wanna be genuine and authentic during your interviews. Um, personally, I used the medical school interview. Um, this, it was like this little book. It wasn't long at all. And it just gave you like more information on how to prepare on this. It's not something like you honestly need, but I felt like it was definitely helpful. So if you wanna look into it, you can. Um, and yeah, you could also search the most common asked questions on Google and just start answering them on a document. And you know, just getting an idea of like how you're going to respond to these questions and you wanna be concise and memorable with your answers as well. Um, so stay calm, think of it as a conversation rather than an interrogation. Um, you just wanna relax. Like of course, you know, some interviews are more comfortable than others, but just be yourself at the end of the day. And make sure that you have at least three questions ready for the interviewer. So, you know, they will ask after the interview, every single one of them will ask, okay, do you have any questions for me? And you want to make sure that you do, because this just shows that you're interested in the program, you're curious about it. And, you know, they want to know that, you know, they just want to know that you have an interest in, in their program for sure. And that'll give you the best chance. Um, so yeah, give those questions and then take advantage of mock interviews. So if you have, you know, I know um, the club here is actually giving more workshops for mock, mock interviews and SNMA just gave a mock interview at UB. Um, definitely look for um, just if there are any mock interviews out there that you wanna do and just make sure you get as much practice as possible. But if there aren't any mock interviews, you can definitely practice with a friend, family member. I practice with my boyfriend all the time and that was very helpful, so yeah. And then lastly, you wanna make sure that you send a thank you letter after the interview. Um, usually it's physicians that are giving these interviews or um, someone obviously they're super busy and they're taking time out of their day to interview you. So you just wanna acknowledge that and definitely give your appreciation to them afterwards. Okay. And then there's also the AAMC fee assistance program. So if this is something you feel like you qualify for, definitely look into it and apply. Um, this would be super, super helpful for all the costs that are involved within the MCAS application. So MCAT um, prep products, $268, reduced registration fee for the MCAT from $325 to $130. Um, you get the two-year subscription to the MSAR that I was talking about, and that's a $36 value. Um, waiver for all the AMCAS fees when it comes to the 20 medical schools um, that you're applying to, and that's a $968 value. And then waiver for the AAMC preview professional readiness ex exam. I actually personally don't know about this. This may be something new. That may be something you guys have to um, think about for your AMCAS cycle, but definitely look into this and do your research because this may be another exam that's needed. Um, and that's apparently $100. Okay. Next, I'm gonna go in, um, go throughout my personal AMCAS application for you guys, just so you guys know exactly, you know, how it looks and just so you have an idea of how the breakdown is. Okay, so um, I once again submitted on June 19th and I received, I, I got a process on July 23rd. So yeah, double AMC ID, school ID, your name, date of birth, legal residence, your contact information, your biographic information, um, yeah, gender, um, whether you're in the military service. Um, so next you have your language information here. So um, Spanish, I'm advanced, English, native speaker, um, always spoken in the home. Um, you also talk about your childhood information. So your primary childhood residence, and then whether you're underserved, your family income level, number in household, um, all this information right here. They also make sure that you give a breakdown of your scholarships and your loans and your grants within undergrad or any um, graduate school. So yeah, that's something you have to put in. And then they also have the disadvantaged information section. So if you definitely are disadvantaged, definitely for sure fill this out. You'll just give like a paragraph, um, I believe on um, just explaining um, that as well. So then you have your parents and guardians here, um, my mom, my dad, and yeah. So next, um, they also have the socioeconomic status disadvantaged, first generation, I'm not, um, siblings, my brother, um, he's 26 at the time, and then additional application information. So um, all this right here. 
And then we go into our stats, guys. So we have our academic record here. Um, so yeah, I went to Pepperdine University, as I said. Here's just a breakdown of all of my grades, all of the courses I took. And you literally have to input all of your grades manually as well, like every single course and grades um, throughout the entire, through the AMCAS application. And then you also have to submit this, um, the transcript so they can, you know, look at both. Um, so yeah, I have my first semester. I also was able to come in with uh, 16 credits from um, from under, no, from high school, I took AP classes. So I was able to use those credits as well in college. Um, I was able to take my first gen chem and um, the lab my first semester of, of college. And then also took gen chem two and gen, gen chem two lab within my second semester of, first, of my first year. So yeah, I did um, okay within my first science classes. And I'm glad that I came in um, only taking one science class at a time because I felt like early on um, in high school, I, I felt like it kind of came natural for me. I didn't feel like I ever had to really study like that. Um, and I did really well, but I definitely was really surprised when I came into college and realized that Gen Chem was just not as easy as I thought it was gonna be. Um, and I ended up really, by the grace of God, getting that B minus and um, very happy that I got that. But um, it was definitely tough, you know, getting through that first year of science classes. Um, and then the rest I took, you know, my liberal arts courses that we had to take, and then Spanish as well. Um, yeah, I took, I ended up going abroad, like I said earlier, I went to Argentina, and I was really nervous about how it would look to um, the admissions committees if I took an entire year off from science courses, because usually they don't, you know, give any science courses abroad. But I was so happy when um, the bio professor, upper division bio professor was able to actually be a faculty member abroad with us. So I was able to take immunohistology and lab while I was in Argentina, uh, ended up getting a B plus, but very happy that I was able to take that. Um, so yeah, I did really pretty well for the rest. Um, came back to uh, Mal the Malibu campus my junior year and I took organic chemistry one and physics uh, my first semester of junior year. And this is when I truly proved to myself that I can take on, um, I feel like these course loads and um, I, I kind of figured out my, my study routine. And I felt like, you know, just proud of myself because I ended up getting the A's in organic chemistry one and general physics. Um, and I ended up getting, um, being chosen to be the TA for OCHEM as well the next semester after that. Um, my second semester, I took cell bio um, and physics two, ended up doing well in that. So um, yeah, other courses, Spanish, and then my uh, senior year biochem, biochem lab, um, and then regular, regular courses for liberal arts and Spanish, of course, as well. So yeah, that's the, my course breakdown. And this is kind of how it looks. So you guys have an idea. Um, they, after that, you go into your education. So your high school, um, where you attended, and then also um, college. So I went to Pepperdine University, and then also spent two months in Madrid at um, a different school as well. So that's that. This is the breakdown of the GPA. Um, as you can see, wasn't so good here. Um, my first semester for science. So this is science GPA. This is all other. And then this is total. Um, I definitely had an upward trend though. So I feel like that's important to have. Um, definitely something that they look out for. So I ended up going from a 2.85 to a 3.78. So um, that definitely looks good. And I ended up getting a cumulative 3.5 as my science GPA. All other, I had a 3.79. Um, that was pretty much upward as well. Little dip here though. Um, and then total, I had a 3.71 GPA. Okay, and then the MCAT breakdown. So I ended up getting a 500, um, 127 on chemistry and physics, guys, uh, 121, which was just really, really low, to be honest, um, for myself, cars. That was my weakest spot in um, MCAT, in the MCAT from the beginning, but I felt like the week before I took the practice exam and ended up doing like getting a 124. So that's what I felt like I was going to get, but I ended up getting that 121 and that ultimately is what pulled down my score. Um, got a 126 in bio, biochem, and then 126 in psych. Okay. So next we have the experiences section. So I'm not gonna go through everything, but um, this is kind of how it looks guys. So we have like 700 characters for just a regular experience. And then if you have a most meaningful experience, you could add another 1325 characters to that. So um, yeah, my 
Uh, one of my most meaningful experiences was being an, a paid intern at a clinical setting during my gap year. Um, so I did that. I was also an online fitness coach, um, summer camp counselor at this, a Lifetime, which is a gym. Um, I, I'm Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority, and I talked about that. Um, I was a TA for Organic Chemistry Lab. Um, hunger and Homelessness Coordinator was one of my most meaningful as well, which was at the Volunteer Center at my school. Um, I actually also was able to work with Conin, which was a foundation in Argentina, the medical clinic that I talked about. So that was another most meaningful experience. And um, I talked about studying abroad for an entire 10 months, um, Argentina and then Spain. I also had talked about my Mercy Medical Center um, volunteering there. So that was a hospital. Um, I was a project sir volunteer and that was um, like this program that we have in my school where you can go um, serve at, um, you know, different programs around the world and um, just be a volunteer. And I did that twice. Um, I talked about shadowing. Um, I was the vice president of the Women's Club Lacrosse team. So I talked about that. College connection leader. I was basically a mentor for um, students or high school students in low income neighborhoods. Um, so that was another experience. I was also, um, I also attended this national youth leadership forum, which was careers in medicine. And they basically just talked about, you know, what it is like to um, be a physician or just any other career in medicine. So talked about that. And then also my Nicaragua mission trip. So yeah, those were all my experiences. Um, this is all recorded and I believe this will actually be posted on my YouTube. So if you guys want to look back, um, you guys can for sure. But these are my personal, my personal statement. And I do have as much information about my experiences and personal statement as well on my YouTube, which I'll provide at the end. But yeah, this is my entire personal statement. And then after that, we have our letters of recommendation and did a committee letter. I also have another individual letter and then the schools. So that's exactly how the entire application looks. And I wanna just let you guys know that you guys can do this for sure. Um, I'm willing to answer any questions right now as well, but if you guys have any questions you know, in the future, you can subscribe to my channel. I do post a lot about pre-med life, but also you know, my journey in medical school. Um, and you could also ask me questions via my Instagram as well. Thank you so much, Dominique. That was amazing. I'm just, and I, I apologize. My name is Beatrice. I'm the founder and um, president of this organization. So I didn't, you know, introduce myself because I was trying to get into the motion, but I want to say thank you so much. You're the reason why I created this club because to show people that we can be a doctor, you know what I mean? And, and being transparent in this field is something that lacks. So we love your transparency. And again, believe in yourself. If she can do it, anyone can do it. If I can do it, anyone can do it. Yeah. Um, just have that confidence, continue to do what you got to do and, and, and don't let no one, you know, tell you anything. Um, we're going to, oh, I did um, put her uh, YouTube stuff in the chat box. We're going to supply more information afterwards, but let's open up to Q&A. Let's hear what, let's see what you got. Are you welcome, Elizabeth? Anytime, girl. Hi, Tyler. How are you? It's the support for me. <laughs> I just got to shout you up for the one time. I literally can't. You can. Okay. So does anybody have questions in the chat? Let me see. So what do you think made you stand out as an applicant? Um, yeah. So I feel like What's made me stand out the most, I feel like, was um, just my passion for working with well, the underserved, but also working with diverse cultures. Um, I did study abroad for a year um, or 10 months at least, and that was just an amazing experience. And I was able to talk more about that and my passion um, for that. And also, I was a Spanish major, and I feel like that's something I really find um, is my passion still to be completely bilingual so that I can, you know, break cultural barriers and language barriers in the future for my patients as well. So I feel like working with the underserved, but also just, um, you know, being, a, I guess, well-rounded and just doing doing what brings me brings me passion is, I feel like that just shines through your application, just making sure that you are doing something that you're actually passionate about. Period. Thank you for that. Um, someone asked, can you tell us about your specific interview? Um, yeah, so let me think. Um, <laughs> I know that my first interview was with Geisinger and it went well, but I still felt like that was, since it was my first interview, I was kind of like, you know, nervous. Um, and I felt like I was just like, 
a little, a little bit antsy for that interview. Um, so that kind of was like coming out of it. I really wasn't sure kind of how, um, if I was going, going to get accepted or not. So I guess I wasn't surprised by the wait list, but definitely that second interview when that came around, I just felt so much more prepared. Uh, and I felt like I could truly be myself. And I guess that definitely was, you know, it showed because I was able to get accepted. <laughs> so very happy to be here at UB. Thank you for that. Someone asked earlier, would it be possible to get your final school list as an example? Oh, yeah, yeah, I can definitely um, send that out. Um, well, actually, I actually think I have it all broken down on my YouTube. So once again, you could definitely subscribe to my YouTube and look at the pre-med playlist. There's literally everything there. How was your first year um, as a medical student has been so far? It's actually been really, really good. Um, I felt like coming in to medical school, I was uh, really anxious, really nervous about how it would turn out. Um, I feel like the month before medical school, I was just like, oh my gosh, am I cut out for this? Like, is this really for me? Um, really second guessing me, myself for, for sure. But um, it really ended up being going really well. Of course, it's a lot of hard work. Um, it's a lot of studying, but I feel like if you find your routine, your rhythm, you could do really well like so definitely just finding your routine is most important in time management um because we do study a lot it's literally like a nine to five of just studying to be honest <laughs> yeah no I, I listen i'm still waiting for that time management video because it seems like you have your stuff down pack okay <laughs> <laughs> oh my god um, well, <laughs> yeah so someone said um i love your youtube channel would you have to retaken the mcat if you were applying this cycle with that score of a 500 yeah, so um, I'm not really sure if I would have, because um, I really feel like there was a lot of factors that stopped me. It wasn't just the pandemic that stopped me from retaking it. Um, honestly, taking that MCAT for the first time, I felt like I did not want to retake it ever again. I was like, I just want to be done, one and done. But um, of course, nothing's wrong with retaking it for sure. Um, do that if that's something you want to do. But I feel like I wouldn't have taken it again. But definitely with the pandemic and just being all the tests being canceled, that definitely really just solidified me not having to retake it. So I hope um, that question. Yeah, thank you. Um, after you had an interview at the University of Buffalo, what made you feel like you were ready? You were already in? Or have that confidence that you yeah were um they were just super like i don't know the interviewers were very um i just felt like they were very i guess relatable and just really wanting to like talk to me and i felt like they were really interested in who i was um as a person like it just it just felt very conversational the um interview and i just felt like very happy about that i felt very comfortable talking to them they're interested even in my like business and my brand stay ambitious co like they wanted my website and they're like oh i want to look you up and stuff i'm like wow like they just seem very interested in me as a person so um i feel like that's something that really just felt like you know this is where i'm supposed to be next um it just felt like that during the interview day and also this was on zoom guys so i didn't do anything in person any interviews in person Oh, that's right. How, so I'll yeah. ask you, what was your experience interviewing on Zoom? I know now yeah. it, it may not be on Zoom, but like, let's let's hear that. Yeah, um, it was interesting. Like part of me was actually, I guess, happier. <laughs> I felt like I could be a lot more comfortable at home. Um, and also it's less money that you have to spend for interviews and all that. But it, it, it was good for me. I feel like everyone's different for sure. It's, it takes away the ability to see your school and see if that program um, is something that you envision yourself being at. Um, honestly, I wasn't able to come to UB until literally the week before coming here. So um, that was just something that's different than most medical school applicants. So, but it was good. It was good for me. I do have a question. How was that transition from like sunny, sunny California to a Buffalo girl? <laughs> I'm still, still trying to get used to it. <laughs> the struggle. Yeah, it was good though. I mean, I feel like I'm so used, to, I honestly love the warm weather for sure, but um, it's been good. Like, I really do feel like I'm meant to be here. So it's, it's been good. The people have been good. My class has been a great class and even the upper classmen, like they're super, um, you know, just, willing to help you and give you all the resources needed to just do well. So I'm really happy to be here at UB. Perfect. Um, in hindsight, is there anything you would change about your application cycle? Hmm, anything I would change? I don't think so. I feel like I don't regret anything. Um, I don't think I would change anything. I think it, it ended up being exactly how it was supposed to be. Yeah, can't change God's plan, right? It yeah. was meant to be. Meant to be. Um, 
How do you feel? How do you feel your YouTube channel has impacted your journey into pursuing medicine? Sorry, my YouTube channel? Is that what you said? Yes. How um, did you feel your YouTube channel has impacted your journey into pursuing medicine? So I actually started my YouTube channel after I got accepted pretty much. So I guess it didn't impact coming into medical school, but um, after I got accepted, I really, I started my YouTube channel and I feel like it has been like a great platform to just um, give as much of my journey to people and give as much value to, you know, the next generation, not only of medical students, but just anyone who's just interested in, you know, reaching their goals. I feel like my um, channel is more than just medicine, but um, I just wanted to be, you know, giving my my journey and just document it and answer as many questions for people in the long run. So um, it has been really cool and I'm happy that I did it. Perfect. Um, how do you make time for your personal life in medical school? That's a good question. Yeah. Um, so I've been doing pretty well with that. Everyone's study routine is different. Um, personally, I came into medical school wanting to just really make sure I have time for myself and um, just for the things I love and just for the people I love as well. So I made sure that um, a routine would kind of align with that. I use Anki for everything. Um, I love Anki so much. Not everyone loves Anki, but it's been something that worked so much for me um, because it's just, I wake up, I do Anki, I watch lectures and I do Anki and I'm pretty much done by six o'clock. Um, that's like the hope every single day. So I feel like that's what's worked for me. Some people don't like Anki or some people um, do other do other things, but I feel like finding what works for you, making sure you really dedicate and prioritize, you know, your health, your, your mental health and just other things that bring you joy. Like I do YouTube, but I also wanna make sure I'm like talking to, you know, my boyfriend every day and talking to family members, my friends and keeping up with them. So um, making sure I'm also working out as well. So that's something that I just, I prioritize. And I feel like if you prioritize it, you can make it work. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I'm also waiting for the Anki video too, because Anki is a whole different... I know, I have to do that video. Yeah. Do you use pre-made pre -made decks or do you Yeah, make your... so at my school, the second years, um, they actually, well, a guy in the second year, he actually made an entire deck for every single class the first year. So I have everything set up. <laughs> so it's, it was really helpful for sure. Perfect. Um, let's see. What factors did you consider when choosing what schools to apply to? Yeah. Um, hmm. So I did apply to a good amount of schools. Um, I'm trying to think back. I would say that location was really big for me for sure. Um, I am from Long Island by New York City and most of the schools are kind of in the East Coast area. I also did apply to some LA schools though for sure because I was happy to go back there. But um, most were like location wise, um, a good fit for me it was East Coast. Um, and I would say when it came down to like just being happy of where I was, I felt like UB really aligned with like my mission. Um, they really do focus in on diversity and the underserved as well. And um, I'm right now a co-manager at Lighthouse and that's something that they spoke about, which is a free medical clinic here. Um, and they spoke about that during my interview as well. So um, I just felt like that was something like it was a good fit for me in choosing and being here at UB. Um, so yeah, just making sure that my mission, my, their mission aligned with kind of what I wanted to do as well. Good, good. Um, what, when applying to medical schools, what did you look for specifically in schools when making your final list, if you will? Um, I think it was mainly just the things I put down on the list. I can go back to it actually. I thought the distance was a pretty good one. I didn't think about that when I applied. Which one? The distance one. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. distance. Mm -hmm. Mainly either from car or um, depending on where it was or flight. But yeah, so I wrote down these, these areas, location, distance, category, um, and also GPA MCAT. So obviously my MCAT did not compare at all, but I still put this as target mainly because my GPA matched up kind of. So yeah, it really kind of, you can decide how you want to make your list but I also color coordinated it versus reach target and safety. I just want to highlight, it says Jacob School of Medicine at the University of Buffalo. It says a 512 was medium MCAT. She got into medical school with the 500 exactly. without research. I'm exactly. telling you, it's possible. 
Exactly. <laughs> have that confidence. You, you will be fine. Like that says something not mm -hmm. saying that you should shoot for, you know, if it happens, you still try your luck. What's meant to yeah, be. Will be try fine. your best no matter what. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Try your best. Um, because we're getting in school period. It's a matter of when and where, like I always say, um, is the Casper exam a category under the free assistance program? Um, you actually do. I'll answer this. Um, you actually do get, um, if you do apply for the FAP, you send them an email and then they'll give you a waiver and then everything is covered under that. So I did it last year and I wind up saving like, I don't know, maybe $90 because it was like nine schools that require them. Okay. Um, so that's pretty good. Um, will you be able to have the template of the final school list example? Um, you guys can take a photo of this or you can go on my YouTube channel. Um, Oh, you mean the template? Um, I could try to, I don't have like an actual template for it, but it's very simple to be honest. If you um, go on like Excel or Google Sheets. Yep, and you can just put, put the yeah. school name, location and follow that. You can take a screenshot, but this also again will be on YouTube, her channel and also on our website. Um, yeah. Do you have any tips for increasing CP chemistry and physics and um, biochemistry and bio, biology? biological scores or biology, I don't know. Um, is this for the MCAT or is yes, this sorry, MCAT? yes, regarding that. Okay. Um, I would say, hmm. Honestly, I feel like now coming into medical school and like utilizing Anki, I've, I love Anki so much. And I felt like if I knew about Anki beforehand, I would have definitely utilized it. Um, so if it's something that you haven't like looked into at all, I feel like Anki is a great resource to start using. Um, but personally, I think I just use Kaplan and I use the AAMC resources. So all of the different questions and word banks or yeah, question banks that they had. And then also all of the... Um, um, practice exams that they had. So I feel like that was really helpful because it really gave you an idea of how the actual exam would be when you use their resources. Um, yeah, just giving yourself ample time and um, just really just, you know, every day really being consistent with it. I said 46 months is a good amount of time depending on your schedule to study for it. So that's kind of what, re what I recommend, but depending on yourself and, you know, how confident you feel with the exam, definitely um, you can figure out, you know, a study schedule that works best for you. Yeah, creating a study schedule is really hard. I'm going to be super honest with you guys. I'm still struggling with doing that. And I'm currently sitting for the MCAT. I'm going to be a reapplicant. It's a struggle. So once you find your niche, just, um, you know, go with it. How no. this is actually a good question. How different is the intensity of medical school curriculum, curriculum compared to medical, um, excuse me, compared to undergrad science courses? And how have you adapted your study techniques? Yeah. Um, so I would say it's a lot more intense in terms of time that you have to put into it. Like in undergrad, I wouldn't say that I um, put in nowhere near as much time in studying. I felt like I could honestly wait till closer to the exam to start studying. Um, so I felt like it really is totally different in terms of the amount of time you put in. But I feel like if you have like a routine that you're consistent with, it's very, very doable. Um, because, you know, with medical school, I have that routine pretty much, pretty much eight hours a day. Um, I'm either watching lectures and studying. Um, so that's kind of like just what works. And I'm doing that. And it's a lot more time, but I feel like it's definitely worked and I've been doing well in, in classes. So it really just depends. Um, I say no matter what with medical school though, you have to be on top of it. Like you cannot slack, you can't try to just finish, you know, start things, you know, closer to the exam. It's not something you can do in, in medical school, but very doable. Good, thank you. Um, when would you take the CASPER? After your primary is submitted? Question. Yeah, I took it after. I took it after. Um, you could take it. I think, I think like right after I submitted it, that's when I started taking, um, or at least like, a, I think I took like a month or like a couple of weeks just to prepare for it. But then um, I took it right after that. It really doesn't take long to get that. And I don't think that stops you from being able to submit at all. So um, yeah, you can definitely do that either after or, or even before it's really up to you. Okay. This question is um, from Musa. It says, okay, this is for me, sorry. Um, since you're a reapplicant, what do you think will be different from the first time you applied? Um, quite a bit. I can actually email you, um, you, send me your email and we can chat and I have no problem talking to you about that. But essentially a little background, not trying to take it the spotlight or anything. Um, 
I, depending on where I'm going to be applying to will be if I'm considered a reapplicant. I had to withdraw my applications because I did not get my, um, my MCAT accommodations for my learning disabilities in time. So I had to kind of push it back. I did spend money, obviously. I did get the, I did get the fee assistance um, program, but um, you know, it is what it is. And honestly, I am so proud uh, that it happened that way because I can actually enjoy the process. I worked my behind off to get to where I am today and actually not feeling like I'm stressed out trying to apply and everything, but just really enjoying and basking in my success. It's just yeah. a beautiful moment. And I'm so happy. I wouldn't change a thing, um, even with the money that I spent, because girl, that was a lot of money, but it is what it is. Everything happens for a reason. So please email me um, or send me a DM, I guess, and then we can kind of go from there. I have no problem. Um, yeah. I agree when it does feel a lot better when you have time to really just enjoy the process and you know take your time with all the you know the sections of the MCAS application so yeah that was definitely something I enjoyed I mean I, I wouldn't say I enjoyed but it was definitely great <laughs> <laughs> right? yeah. really enjoy applying for a lot like better <laughs> um all right I think this, if you guys have any other questions let us know but this is I think it's the last question and I think I have one as well but it says when studying for the MCAT did you mostly did you mostly content review or practice questions and exams? Um, I definitely did content review. I would say this is, it's interesting because I feel like this was such a long time ago now, but um, I definitely did content review. And then I would say a month and two months or a month and a half before the exam is I really just was doing a lot of the WMC resources, all those qu questions. Um, and then all of the um, practice exams. So I was taking a practice exam every single week before my MCAT. So I think there's four practice exams on there. Oh, wow, wow. Okay. Yeah. Did you actually, you know how um, before you take the MCAT, they kind of say, look at your score first. Were you surprised when you got your MCAT score back? Yeah, then? yeah, I was. <laughs> so I literally, my M the, and the WMC practice exams were very similar to, um, it honestly was, it was very similar to the quest, like the breakdown of how the ex actual exam is. But I was like the week before I got a 506 on my practice exam. So I felt like a lot prepared, a lot more prepared. I was like, okay, I'm going to do good. Um, so yeah, I was very surprised by my 500, but you know, it is what it is and I'm still here. So <laughs> period. Yeah. Um, real quick, do you know if UB School of Medicine prefers in-school state applicants since it's a public school? Yes, they actually um, do respectfully. Um, when I applied last cycle, I think from the MSTAR, from what I've seen, um, so this was probably maybe 2019, I think, they actually had, um, they accepted, their class, their first class was 80% in-state. Yeah, so they do prefer, yeah. Yeah, 20%. They do accept, they do accept that for sure. Do not allow that to stop you. Hello, we're yeah. getting into medical school. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. um, Elizabeth said, I love your YouTube channel between you. And it was so nice seeing you in real time. Yes, it is really nice seeing you. I actually um, met Dominique, if you will, on from YouTube. <laughs> I was, you know, applying to medical school last uh, summer. And, um, you know, my accommodations didn't come in. I'm like, oh my gosh, should I take this MCAT? I wasn't sure. I'm like, you know, what? let me just, you know, pray to God. Let me just get a 500. And I literally typed in 500 on a YouTube and her <laughs> video popped up. That's and awesome. um, recently I was like, I saw a photo of her. I'm like, wait, I know her and I couldn't pinpoint. It. And I finally realized like, oh my God, that's so crazy. So again, <laughs> it's just, it's wild and look like, you know, she's impacting you guys too. So it's very, it's very, very, very nice. I do have a question because I think this is something that, um, many people kind of are wary of or just you know they're just unsure how does how can you manage your relationship while in medical school do you think that's attainable <laughs> yeah my boyfriend's on the call actually but I, I definitely like... must have two cents too. <laughs> chime in how has it been from that perspective as well <laughs> Tyler um, I don't want to take a bite, but I mean she's handled being really being in a relationship like amazingly I can't can't describe it. I didn't think like, I didn't, I didn't really know what to expect when mm -hmm. I think school, I think, okay, yeah, I'm great. I'm never going to be able to talk to her again, but <laughs> yeah. she does a normal job with handling school, excelling in school, and then being able to talk and communicate with me. So being yeah. long distance now, this is, I couldn't ask for anything. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. But, Thank you. 
yeah, I definitely feel like I have been able to manage it well. Um, we talk every single day and even throughout the day, sometimes like while I'm doing Anki, I'll just have him like there or because um, he works at like an office as well. So he can like literally have his FaceTime there as well. So it has been working um, <laughs> very well for us. And that makes me happy because that was something I was definitely concerned about as well. But it's been it's been good. Everyone's saying y'all so cute. But I just wanted to get a quick Snapchat really quick with you guys, if you don't mind. Ready to say cheese, Tyler? <laughs> okay, um, we're gonna, if you guys have any questions, let us know, going once, yeah. going twice. Please scan this. Um, we're gonna send this information afterwards, but please scan this um, so you can watch her YouTube. She has an amazing uh, pre-med playlist, but you can also follow her journey on, um, through medical school. Hello, it's not gonna stop here and through residency mm -hmm. and people because what we're doing is we're inspiring our community because we're going to be doctors period, period, period. Um, everyone is saying it's great it's okay to dm you on insta yes it is you yes, can DM her. Is. we will give you the information stay dot ambitious underscore and then ambitious stay ambitious dot co am i getting this right Sorry. yeah stay ambitious dot co is my brand instagram yeah, yeah. <laughs> and please follow her that there as well if you guys have any questions, let us know. If not, we're going to end this. Everyone Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Really helpful and inspiring info. I appreciate your transparency. We're actually going to have a, a workshop next month, a personal statement. So you may see her again. Who knows? We'll see. <laughs> um, but yes. Uh, yes, I'm proud of you. Thank you. That was from Michelle. So Aww. I guess that's it, right, Dominique? Do you have anything else to add? Um, that is it. I really am thankful to be here. I hope I was able to give, you know, good, good value to you guys and thank you for joining and I'm giving you guys the best of luck for all of your applications and future um, just accomplishments in the future for sure. All right, guys, don't give up on your dreams. Continue to chase them. You're going to be doctors. I'll see you guys later. Bye, Dominique. Thank you so much. And Bye. Uh, thank you, Tyler. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. No thank you. Thank you.